it's all good. It's all good. So all good. we're we're back. Some of you may have thought that we wouldn't be back. Others of you were probably counting on the fact that we'd be back, but Heather and I are back. We are uh, we are just beginning to build the brand, the Happy Hour with Heather and Guest brand, and that means that we need more than one episode. So uh, this is episode number two, and I'm really uh, looking forward to this. I hope you yeah. are as well. I am. I'm, I think we've got some... We've got some good topics to cover today. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, for the inaugural episode, uh, the band Low Orbit had been suggested by Heather, um, and then we both came up with music that had gotten us through. I had picked Nirvana, Heather picked Crocus. Uh, interestingly, when I, when I was telling my uncle about the episode, he said he'd heard of Crocus before, which... Uh, I was surprised at because that's not his, he's more of like a Bachman Turner overdrive type uh, type listener. But uh, I guess I guess if you were to continue that trajectory, maybe Crocus would fall into line. I, I, I don't really know. But I've already gone off on a tangent and we're only three minutes into the show, so. Oh, and I, I forgot, I forgot my sound effects. I'll have to remember that for the next episode. Oh, oh, wait, you know what I do have? Hold on, I got to reach. Excuse my reach, everyone. So when I was doing a fistful of faceful, I had a bunch of stock phrases that I used to say all the time. And Heather was kind enough. You can see she made a bingo card that had all the stock phrases that I used to say. <laughs> and and sometimes I would purposefully go back to saying them, hoping that someone would be playing along and would get bingo. So uh, if you're out there and you've ever gotten a bingo, then uh, you should let us know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we have stuff to give away. We have a lot of stuff to give away. So, you know, bingo might be a good way to do it. Sure. Well, yeah, we, Heather and I both have a, uh, compact discs and a couple of other things that would be uh, a worthwhile giveaway. I'm sure we will be sending out email blasts, letting you know the details. But uh, yeah, but if you have an old bingo card and, uh, and you haven't cheated, not that you would, <laughs> because uh, I have faith that you would have, uh... yep, total package, cubicle, tangent, Finance, indulge, time in Asia. I mean, I, I, the, not a day goes by that I don't drop almost all of those. So, I think I, I think you should keep it, and you could probably use it for this also. Sure, sure. Well, you know, uh, my insight probably will carry over a lot of a lot of what I brought to the old podcast. Um, so before we get started with this show, uh, I would, on behalf of Heather, I would also like to give a big thanks to uh, Mark Kitchens for uh, writing and recording the theme song for this show, which is titled uh, Quadruple H. Uh, G. No, 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 sorry, Triple Triple H G Quadruple F. That's what it is. Yeah. I got my numbers wrong. <laughs> and I'm the son of an I'm the son of an accountant, so I shouldn't have gotten my numbers wrong. But yeah, and it, cool title, really cool. Uh, you know, he said it was a merge of our represents the merge of our two projects, which I thought was really. I mean, he totally got it. He totally nailed it. I, I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, he he went above and beyond. It's a great track. It'll be available on the twenty fourth um as a single so all of you should pre-save it on spotify right now and uh yeah it's a, it's a jam it really sort of we gave him very minimal uh, directions with what we had hoped for and he really just went above and beyond so yeah and he put it up on Bandcamp too uh as um you know, you can pre pre order it on Bandcamp, and then you'll get it as soon as it's released. 
So uh, I, uh, we do have the Bandcamp link on our blog if you, um, you know, if you'd like to get it on Bandcamp. Definitely go uh, hit pause right now. Go uh, pre-order it if you're watching this uh, or listening to it. And uh, you know we'll we'll still be here, but uh, it's definitely a great jam. And uh, it yeah, it's a, just a great jam. I mean that's really it. I was going to say more, but I don't need to. <laughs> that so, describes it. <laughs> yes, it is a jam. And I think that was on the bingo card, the word jam, probably. It is. <laughs> it's but, on there. Uh, but so this week, last week, Heather selected Low Orbit to be the inaugural episode. This week, I picked uh, a group called Witch Tit, who uh, I have listened to before. I actually interviewed them on the Fistful of Faceful podcast. And uh, they are very much a straight up doom throwback, which is why I thought they would be a good band to, uh, to check out. They have uh, their first album, which may be a little bit more difficult to find is a split with a group. I believe it's uh, Atoliated or Atilated is the name of the group that they have a split with. They have two songs from that album. Um, I don't know if that'll be available on the uh, playlist that we'll put up because those might have been hard to find. Um, yeah, I just put the, I just put their full album. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. Um, yeah. Their, their debut album is called Intoxicating Lethargy. And we will, uh, we will talk about that. Um, the, the first two tracks uh, are really, are really great. Um, the guitarist, I believe, is singing. So it wasn't until, I guess I can provide a little bit of a history uh, to, to set the stage for the group. But um, uh, the first two tracks, they have a group called Hallucinate, uh, group. They have a song called Hallucinations, which is sort of like a, a, a Black Sabbath, uh, the song Black Sabbath. It's like a long sort of drawn out jam. Um, and then the second song is called The Void. And uh, in both cases, I believe it's uh, also sung by the guitarist who, when I interviewed him, said that he typically wasn't a singer. Um, so by the time they did Intoxicating Lethargy, they, they have a new lead singer uh, whose name is Rain, I think. Um, and she really brings a lot to the table in terms of the vocals. So, uh, yeah, I mean, should we just jump right into track number one? Sure. Which, which I believe is, uh, is called um, Silver Tongue. This is, uh, this is, so we're gonna, we'll skip over Hallucinations and the Void off of their, uh, their debut split um, because those won't be available. But uh, the, the, the album, the, the split, has signs of sort of what they're capable of. Uh, you know, th the sound that will be developed in the first album. So if you're sort of interested to see what they're building on, you can go back on your own and check it out on Bandcamp. But- uh, I thought the, um, when I listened to it, especially The Void, um, what I notice is uh, their songs, they, they're slow and then they speed up and then they slow back down again. It's like the tempo changes a lot within the song. And I thought that the, especially the void, it had a real spooky vibe to it. And I thought it would be a great, great for a horror movie soundtrack. Definitely. I, I wrote down for hallucinations. Uh, I said, doom like black, the track black Sabbath. And then I said the wrong notes become the right notes. And then for The Void, I wrote soundtrack song, like on a journey. And then I said, the riff is like being hit in the head with a pillowcase full of marshmallows and rusty nails. <laughs> so oh, that's, that's quite a description. Yeah. yeah, well that, yeah. I remembered 
that was a description I'd come up with a, with a buddy of mine a long time ago, and I thought it fit this song particularly well. So um, if you get the chance, uh, Hallucinations and The Void are both on Bandcamp, um, so you can check them out. Uh, it, it kind of shows you the direction they're headed as a band that I think they fully develop with their debut album, Intoxicating Lethargy, um, plus the addition of a new lead singer, which I think um, sort of allows them to reach their full potential. But, um, but if you're interested, you can track their growth as a band. I would say they're probably one of my favorite doom bands that's working right now, just in terms of the compositions and the vocals and the playing and stuff like that. Um, if, if I was going to have to pick like a top five contemporary doom bands right now, I would say they'd be on that list. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I never heard, I've, I never heard of them before you introduced me to them. So this was, you know, I know you had played them on your podcast before, um, but to sit down and listen to all of their music, um, they you know, that was pretty cool. And I can, I can see why you like them so much. Yeah, they, I, I, you know, they were, they were very gracious with their time uh, when I spoke to them. And they also agreed to do, to stream their live set from a few months back on the Facebook group. Uh, but musically, I also really was attracted to the sound that they had. Um, I remember talking to uh, two of the band members who, I think are both one of them or both of them were self-taught in terms of the guitar and, and the drums. So uh, I, I think it was the drums, you know, I, sh I, I can't remember. I'm going to blame the aneurysm and that's on the bingo card. Um, but I do remember the, the, one of the primary songwriters not, in, you know, being self-taught. So I feel like a lot of the music is going to be uh, non-traditional in terms of its composition. So there are going to be chord progressions or notes that sound a little bit, not off, but sound like they're unorthodox because I feel like in certain, in some cases, music theory wasn't part of the repertoire, but, uh, but I think they make it work. Um, and therefore it's not gonna be very derivative. It's gonna be sort of original um, and like you, like you had said, they do incorporate kind of a slow, fast, slow tempo, uh, but it's not formulaic. I feel like it's all fits the song. You know, it's not like they're trying to fit the song into a formula, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, that makes sense. But uh, yeah, so Silver Tongue, I think is the... Uh, the lead track off of Intoxicating Lethargy. Um, I wrote that they're really hitting their stride now with, uh, with sort of the, you know, the full band rounded up and, uh, you know, they're sort of capitalizing on what they did well on the previous tracks. But I also said this sounded like it would be in the background of a Western. So. Yeah, I thought the, the, Soaring vocals really complements a doom song. Um, the guitar, I, I really like the guitar, you know, what they did with the guitar. And while the singer, she has powerful vocals, she doesn't overshadow the music, which I think is incredibly important. Um, I've listened to a lot, <laughs> a lot of you know, singers that their voices are so powerful that you can't even hear the instruments in the background. And this, they complement each other very well. Yeah, that's the word I, I complimentary seemed, you know, they, they, all the instruments work well, the vocals complement the, the, the riffs really well. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it didn't, it's definitely within the doom genre, but I feel like a lot of it is innovative, you know, original work to them. 
even though they're sort of capitalizing on a lot of the themes that you that you find in Doom, they're, they're, they've really made it their own thing. So uh, that was Silver Tongue Crimson Tide. I forgot to take any notes on that. So if you if you want to run with the ball, feel free to. <laughs> sure. Um, it has to me. This song had more of a traditional doom feel to it. Um, the the vocals to me they got more haunting as the song went on. Um, the range in her voice goes really well with the instruments. Um, And that's all I had. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't think more, you need... but it, was, it was for the next song. <laughs> yeah, well, the, so the, the third song is also Intoxicating Lethargy, which is what the album is named. Uh, I wrote down that it was really a showcase for the singer um, in terms of uh, being able to demonstrate kind of all that she's capable of. Uh, and I said that it combined all the great elements of the previous songs, you know, in terms of the originality of the riffs and all of the instruments working well together. Yeah, the, to me, the song felt like an anthem. Right. Um, it has, it's like a, like a story that has a slow buildup and a triumphant end. And I do, I do think that this is the song on the album, like you say. Yeah, it, it, when I was teaching creative writing and we would talk about story arc, there's a pyramid that you try to hit, which is um, has exposition and rising actions and then a climax and then falling actions and then a conclusion. And I feel like this song has all of those elements in it, um, like you had just said. Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, that's really, I would say if you're going to pick a song from this album to kind of, uh, you know, to be the single, so to speak, that you're going to play, I would say it would be Intoxicating Lethargy. It has elements of all the other songs, everything they do really well. Um, that's followed by a group called, a group, why do I keep doing that? A song called Traveler, which I wrote was similar to the first, the tracks off their split album in that it felt like some of it were wrong notes that were kind of made right in a way that there was uh, kind of, it, there were like dissonant qualities to it that felt like it was on the cusp of being an incorrect note that was sort of forged or bent to fit the song. And I don't know if that makes sense or not. <laughs> yeah, it's, um. I like how the pacing of the song changes. Uh, there's a lot, like, you know, what I think you're speaking about. There's a lot of tempo changes within the song. And they're not, like what you said before, they're not, you know, um, they're just to try to fit within the song, you know. So it is a little bit different, but it, it makes it really interesting. Definitely. I feel like um, when you, you know, when you're, when you, you're not beholden to formula a lot of the time, uh, you know, if you're, if you're an autodidact or you're self-taught or something, you can kind of explore things without knowing that you're not to necessarily supposed to be doing that. Um, and I feel like they're really, they're really innovative, um, you know, bringing yeah. forth a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, and I wrote for their last, their last track is called Home Invasion. And I wrote, it was the darkest and most witchiest. Yeah, so. I got the same. <laughs> I, it has an eerie vibe to it. Um, it's, this song actually is my favorite on the album. Uh, great way to end the album, um, especially with the guitars at the end. It was yeah. really, really great. So there you go, Witch Tit. If you're looking for a pull quote, we both endorse uh, Home Invasion. It's the darkest, most witchiest. And uh, and yeah, I, I, 
I was so ready just to hammer home darkest, most witchiest that I forgot what you said. <laughs> I apologize. That's your catchphrase for this one. <laughs> yes, last time we had trippy bluesy, and this time uh -huh. it's darkest, most witchiest. Yes. So, but uh, yeah, so that's Witch Tit. Um, definitely pick up Intoxicating Lethargy. It's a great Doom album. Uh, really, if you're a fan of, I mean, really just great music, but if Doom is your genre and you're looking for a contemporary band, uh, as we all are, I mean, that's the, the sort of point of, of what I've been trying to do over the last couple of years. I know Heather is similar in that, just trying to provide an opportunity to give a platform to these bands. But uh, Witch Tit, I believe, is from North Carolina. They're pretty active. If you get a chance to to see them or pick up their music, I definitely would recommend doing so. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. So we got two thumbs up, which two is thumbs great. Up. Two thumbs yeah. up. Um, same with low, low Orbit got two thumbs up. This gets two thumbs up. And uh, shall, we, shall we segue into uh, music that got us through? Yes. Okay. Would you like to go first or should I? Um, sure, I can go first. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so my, um, I worked in a, um, when I was younger, my, my dad has a tool and die shop and I worked there for a little while when I was younger and, <laughs> um, I worked in the shop with the guys, ran the machines, and um, a lot of what I did was production work. So you're making the same part over and over and over again, which can be incredibly boring. And so <laughs> one of the guys that worked in the shop, uh, he had control of the CD player. And uh, it was Nirvana, Soundgarden, and Alice in Chains on constant rotation. And the guys out in the shop, they would get mad because we listened to it every day, all day. And so just to please them, he would put on one of their CDs every once in a while, but then it, it, it would immediately get taken off and then Nirvana, and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains would get put right back in again. <laughs> so super sky point to Jeff, um, wherever he is. I hope it's a good place. But for Soundgarden, I chose Slaves and Bulldozers. Um, Chris Cornell, my all time favorite singer. Um, you know, <laughs> what's in this for me? a great lyric. Uh, it's like he could foretell the future and is singing for our current times, which is incredible, you know, and I know we, we talked about Nirvana last, you know, in our last episode. And when you spoke about how Nirvana, you felt that they wrote music just for you. Um, that's how I feel about Soundgarden. I, I, I think that Chris sang, when he sang, it sounded like it was just for me. And um, he was a singer for my time. And that's how I felt about it. Um, and for Alice in Chains, I picked Angry Chair. Um, the tone, <laughs> the guitar tone on that song is absolutely insane. And it's so terrible, you know, that we lost Kurt Cobain, Chris Cornell, Lane Staley. Um, you know, Lane's style was really unique the way he sang. You know, his vocal delivery was incredibly unique. Um, the songs are dark. And, you know, I went through, I've been through some really dark times. So I felt like, I felt like I related to a lot of what he was singing about, you know, so the, the, those are the songs that, you know, got me through those times. Sure. Well, and, and Lane Staley actually wrote Angry Chair. I think most of, most of the other tracks, I think, were written by Jerry Cantrell. And he wrote uh, that one? 
but yeah, because yeah. Jerry, I think, challenged him, you know, you're you're such a great singer and you're a great musician. You should write yeah. some, some of the songs. So he wrote Angry Chair. Yeah, um, it's a great song. It's a great song. It is. Yeah. It definitely is. Though, yeah, those are great choices. I could say, and we, uh, Slaves and Bulldozers uh, from Germany were a band that played on uh, the Facebook group. They so, did, yeah. They did, yeah, yeah. And that, that's where they got their um, their name from. Yeah. So. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would I would say that those were your choices were and continue to be some of my favorites. So I will uh, I will probably have them on rotation to help get me through something in the future. But uh, we'll go back back in time to 1996 when. Uh, the, the two songs that I had at the time were uh, off of Weezer's debut album, the Blue Album, which came out in 94. Uh, and I would, um, this was the summer after I'd graduated from high school and I worked as an intern for Troma Films, which uh, is responsible for movies such as The Toxic Avenger, and uh, my personal favorite stuff, Stephanie in the uh, incinerator. Um, so when I was there, they had an office, I think, on Ninth Avenue in the in the forties, maybe. And I would go in in the morning and just basically help out. Like I'd put press kits together. I would um, uh, answer, you know, answer the phone. I would uh, run out and, and make deliveries, uh, basically anything anyone needed in the office. Um, and at the time, I think they were mostly in acquisitions. So they would just acquire, you know, movies that had been made. They, uh, when I was there, they had just bought the rights to a film called Cannibal the Musical, which was uh made by two guys named Trey Parker and Matt Stone who the following year would make South Park but uh this was sort of before that had happened so I just remember hearing a buzz about these two college kids who made this independent film called Cannibal the Musical that was really funny um also at the time that I was there uh James Gunn the director of uh, such films as Suicide Squad and Guardians of the Galaxy was working uh, for Troma. I think he had been hired to write the script for a film called Tromeo and Juliet, which maybe had come out the year before. And now he was sort of working there on staff. Um, and he was really cool. Uh, he sort of took me under his wing. Um, you know, because I had a lot of questions about being an aspiring filmmaker. And uh, yeah, geez, I, it's, you know, this is like 25 years ago. So I don't really have very many memories. But I do remember that uh, for as much fun as it sounds to be there, it wasn't that much fun to work there. Um, it was really stressful as like an intern. Um, so I remember I would listen to the song Holiday by Weezer and the world has turned and left me here. And I don't know why, but those were the two songs that were just, I would have my disc man and I would listen to them on the way to and from work. And then uh, towards the end, I guess I had worked there for a few weeks and then I got mononucleosis. So I had to stop working. Um, that really has nothing to do with the story uh, or the music, but um, it's just what happened next. So I stopped working there to recover from mono. And I just remember watching the uh, Olympics that year in Atlanta um, while being sick with mono. So uh, yeah, so I, I rubbed elbows with a young James Gunn before he went off to make some films and I was there when they acquired Cannibal the Musical. Um, 
looking back on it now, I probably would have much more fun, you know, working there in my 40s than I did, you know, working there when I was 17. But we can't, uh, we can't always get what we want, as the Rolling Stones once said. Yeah. So, but and uh, could you, after you recovered from mono, could you have gone back? Would, would uh, they have taken you back? Yeah, I think they, you know, it, they, you know, being an intern, I wasn't paid anything. So I think they definitely would have taken me back to just, you know, they, they stocked the place with interns. There were like six of us working there um, because believe it or not, they were pretty frugal with, uh, with paying people. Um, but uh yeah, I, you know, at the time, I just remember thinking, this is, like, I'm getting, you know, I, I remember one time I gave, because I didn't know any better, someone called the office looking for one of the, the two, uh, you know, producers, and I remember I gave the guy one of the producer's cell phone numbers, because I thought he would need to be reached, because he sounded like it was important. And then uh -huh. I got, I got chewed out later on for, you know, never give out. So I just felt like, you know what, this is not, I, I just feel like I'm walking on eggshells here all the time. I'm always making mistakes and uh, it just didn't seem like the best fit. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but now I think I'd have a better appreciation for, you know, um, working at the studio that made such fair as stuff Stephanie and the incinerator and you know um geez I just I I just remember there was so many like everything do you remember the USA up all night show no it was like the precursor to um Joe Bob Briggs okay and it was with um Rhonda I think Rhonda Shear was the host but they used to show like um uh, frogs, you know, about Arana, the secret of Shadow Lake, or all these like really awful exploitation movies, um, you know, like Sorority House Massacre Part Two and stuff. And I just, I feel like now I have better, uh, a better appreciation. Yeah, Mr. Tromo was on Joe Bob's show. <laughs> he, he, he sat and talked with them, his show at the drive in. He's, and talked with him uh about <laughs> some of the movies and about you know funny uh about some of the exploitation and uh kind of what his views on that were and it was pretty interesting he's uh he's an interesting guy yeah well I mean it was it's interesting to think back you know at at what was happening, you know, what was happening back then and my, my involved, you know, I wasn't involved in anything, but just sort of understanding now that like the guy who would go on to have an A-list career was also, you know, cutting his teeth there. And, uh, you know, and the, the guys who created South Park, that's where they sort of got their foot in the door. Um, yeah, I never knew that. <laughs> yeah, so. that's pretty, that's pretty, pretty wild. Yeah, no, yeah. it's uh, that's that's me rubbing elbows with uh, <laughs> with people who would go on to to make uh, quality films like that. I I want to say stop Stephanie and the Incinerator a third time because I think now the Candyman will show up. But uh, for those of you, yeah, I don't, I don't, that, I guess that joke fell flat. But uh, it's all good. <laughs> There's a new Candyman coming out. I know, I know. Yeah. It, uh, the The first one is really good. But uh, should we, speaking of movies, should we get into our movie recommendation? Sure. Okay, so uh, the movie that we're both going to recommend today is Real Genius with uh, Val Kilmer and Gabe Jarrett. Uh, it's a comedy from the 80s uh, about uh, some genius kids at college who get fooled into building a laser for the government, and then they get their sweet, sweet revenge. But um, 
There are a lot of funny lines. I mean, pretty much everything, every line is quotable. Uh, and I met one of my best friends through a, mu a mutual admiration of the film. We both, you know, I think one of us quoted it and the other person recognized it. And then it was just, you know, oh yeah, no, you're going to be in my inner circle now. That's, that's the type, if you like real genius and you quote from real genius, that's the sort of movie that allows you to decide whether you should be friends with someone. So. Yeah. It's a um, very sweet movie. <laughs> uh, it, it has a classic theme of good versus evil. Uh, Val Kilmer is incredibly charming in it. And I, I can see why you like it so much. Yeah. And it's funny because I just wrote an essay uh, about Val, you know, that includes Val Kilmer. Um, so it's sort of, I guess this is an example of synchronicity where the universe is orchestrating that we talk about Val Kilmer. And the but, door. And the door, yeah. The elbow and the doors, yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, and heat. And, uh, and heat. oh my gosh, heat. Uh, wow, it, it's got an excellent cast excellent cast one of the best crime films ever um you know what's interesting about it too is michael mann he based the story out of a real police detective in chicago which i think is <laughs> really cool you know because i i live in illinois and chicago's not that far away yeah chuck adams mm -hmm. that was yeah. the guy, that was the guy yeah and neil mccauley was a real criminal that Chuck Adams and hunted. Yeah, yeah, and and um, uh, to, I believe I believe two of the um, cast members were actually uh, were were in prison for a while. Sure. Well, so, Danny Danny Trejo played uh, one of the one of Neil's crew. He's the guy who he's the Latino guy with the huge tattoo on his chest. Yeah. He yeah. Was in, um, yeah, he was in, uh, I want to say he was in Folsom, maybe, or, uh, but yeah, he, he was in prison for a while. He was actually the welterweight prison boxing champion. And, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, he, so, so here, since, since the can of worms is opened. <laughs> is he, it tantrum time? <laughs> oh, yeah, well, so, because Danny Trejo's been in a ton of stuff. You know, he's, you, you've seen him, he's always, uh, Although these yeah. days he's play he's he's playing you know most of the time he's the tough guy, uh, you know gangster or uh, prisoner or, but um, he uh, was a sponsor for I think Cocaine Anonymous and one of one of someone who needed help called him and said I'm working on this film set and. Uh, I'm thinking of using, can you come and, you know, help me out? So Danny Trejo showed up at the movie set. It was for a movie called Runaway Train with John Voight and Eric Roberts. And uh, the guy who wrote it was this guy named Eddie Bunker who'd served time with Danny Trejo. So they got him a job working on the film uh, as, you know, as like a an extra who then became an actor in the movie um and that sort of got his foot in the door and then he just kept getting cast in all of these different you know now he's got a huge career yeah and i think the the wayne grow character uh i think he was in prison for a, for a while too yes um, kevin gage that's kevin gage kevin gage yeah he was uh okay yeah, he served. He was apparently he was a model prisoner. I think he was in prison after he played Wayne Grow. So that's, oh, okay. that's what people okay. called him in prison. And uh, yes, but yeah, uh, great, great movie. And like, well, you know, and it, it, I, I thought it had won, you know, I was saying, I, I had thought it had won an Oscar for best sound, but it, uh, it, it didn't. It, got totally snubbed at the Oscars which is unfortunate because it's such a great movie 
Yes. Well, even though we were talking about Real Genius, Heat is one that you definitely need to see as well. So this will be a twofer. Heather's recommendations with me are that you should see Real Genius and Heat. Make it a Val Kilmer double. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Tombstone. <laughs> make, it a, make it a triple. You know, Val Kilmer's incredibly charming in that movie, too. Um, the Ghost in the Darkness. Make it, yeah, make it a, we'll just keep adding the logistic. On a you know, weekend, go, you know, go I would say, world. I would say go to Blockbuster, but uh, on yeah. a weekend, just uh, go on Amazon Prime or Netflix and do yeah. yourself a favor and watch all these Val Kilmer movies. Have a Kilmer sewed. <laughs> and the, the, the Ghost in the Darkness, um, they're at the Field Museum in Chicago, so that's why I wanted to bring that up, too. Sure. Well, this has been uh, another trip down memory lane for me, revisiting uh, my time at Troma Films, talking about other great Val Kilmer movies, and, uh, and of course, Witch Tit. So um, all of you out there should go pick up Witch Tit's debut album, Intoxicating Lethargy. You should see all the movies that we recommended and uh, if you're looking for songs to get you through, then check out uh, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Nirvana. And uh, yeah, are- I would say why not? Yeah, I mean, that, that was sort of unique to that time and place. Um, I would say now those probably aren't even my favorite songs off that album. But for some reason, those were the two that were on heavy rotation in the time. So yeah, and I I have all of this. I have all the songs that we talked about. I have them on a playlist. Cool. So, yeah. So if you're curious to hear what we're discussing, literally, then uh, the playlist will be accessible in the links. And uh, I think I mean that's I've certainly spoken enough tonight. So I'm okay. gonna take a take a breather. But thank you so much, Heather. This is again. This is. Uh, the perfect, the perfect chance to reflect on all this great stuff. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And thank you everyone for listening. And, yeah. and we'll thank be you. back. We will be back. Episode three coming at some point. Yes. 